Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. I wanted to jump in on this debate about the child tax credit or cash benefits for children more generally. Last week there were a couple of conservative articles that were arguing that if we're going to have a cash benefit for children, it's super important that it not include poor kids. You know, you can pay cash benefits to middle class kids and even upper class kids, but lower class kids, they should not get any money. I think that's a big mistake, and I think the articles arguing that are not well written um, and not well reasoned. So let's jump into it. I wanted to start by kind of giving a little context, getting you nice and primed to understand how uh, out of touch these arguments are with the rest of the world. So, you know, the United States is not, in fact, the only country in the world. Um, Our policy debates, they tend to exist in a sort of silo where we act like there's no other place in the world and we're all just kind of grabbing grasping in the dark about what a good policy might be. But actually, there are lots of countries in the world, and almost all developed countries have a cash benefit for kids. So we've got this uh, article from Finland. This is from November. I thought this was uh, great just to kind of show the opposite uh, extreme. Uh, In December of this year, Finland actually paid a double benefit for kids, uh, which is described in this article as an extra month of child allowance benefit ahead of Christmas. Uh, So, you know, every month in Finland, you get a certain amount of euros deposited to your bank account for each kid you have. They just doubled that payment for December, which to me seems like a very humane policy. After all, uh, people have a lot of child-related expenses in December, including the purchasing of Christmas presents. So, uh, you know, a very nice touch, I felt like. But it's not just Finland. Uh, So we see here, this is an attempt to... uh, uh, this is an attempt to create a map that uh, gives the child benefits for all these different countries. It's a little bit difficult to kind of uh, flatten it to something like this because the rules differ and all this kind of stuff. But this is the best effort I've seen so far. As you can see, any country that's green or any geographical area that's green, because some of these benefits vary um, subnationally, any area that's green has a child benefit for kids. Um, And in any area that has a pink outline, you see here, not based on income, that area, the benefit is a universal benefit. So it's not based on your income at all. Um, Even the ones that do base it on your income, they don't typically exclude poor kids. They'll exclude richer kids. Now, I think that's a mistake as well. But and I've I've done a couple of videos on that already, but I won't go into that here because the main dispute here is whether we should, in fact, include the poor. The first article I saw last week saying that we should definitely not include poor kids when it comes to child benefits was written at First Things Magazine. I think this is a religious magazine. Um, So, you know, very, very in keeping with the teachings of Jesus Christ, no doubt, that the child tax credit should promote work and marriage by Patrick T. Brown and W. Bradford Wilcox. Um, And again, I want to emphasize here... um, What they're talking about is saying, uh, is just not giving child benefits to poor people. You know, in in America's most influential journal of religion and public life, a Christian magazine. Um, But anyways, how do they pitch this here? We've got this little text. Too many on the left do not appreciate that a Biden-style credit, by Biden-style credit, they mean benefit, a child benefit that also goes to poor people poses its own problems. Ending poverty isn't as simple as sending a check. This can have its own perverse cultural consequences, as the legacy of aid to families with dependent children program shows. A child benefit that has no connection to work can reinforce two troubling dynamics. So before we get into that, um, let's tackle some of this, right? Ending poverty isn't as simple as sending a check. It, it is that simple. Um, we basically ended elderly poverty in the United States by sending checks to old people. Um, elderly poverty used to be 50 plus percent. I probably should have pulled that up. Um, and now it's down in the single digits. And it's probably even lower than the way it's measured because the way it's measured doesn't include certain uh, incomes and drawdowns of savings and stuff that maybe it plausibly should. Um, but that that's how we ended pov- elderly poverty. And you could end child poverty 
the exact same way. Um, when they're talking about perverse cultural consequences as the legacy of aid to families uh, with dependent children shows, AFDC, they're talking about a program that existed for about 50 years um, that provided a cash benefit to poor single mothers, basically. And the problem uh, with this benefit uh, and using this as an analogy is that the AFDC program, if you made above a certain income, you would lose benefits from the AFDC program on a dollar for dollar basis. So if you lost, if you went from making, you know, $300 a month to $400 a month, let's say in terms of your earnings, that would be a hundred extra earnings, hundred dollars of extra earnings, and you would lose a hundred dollars of child benefit. And, and that would be true for like the $600 range of income. So like basically you had this massive benefit cliff where if you got over a certain line, just working was of no use to you whatsoever. Um, I had a hard time finding like <laughs> good documents about this because this program ended uh, over 25 years ago. But here, here we've got it described in this GPO um, document. Um, they began to reduce the AFDC grant dollar for dollar for earnings in excess of the standards earning disregard. Um, that was all, all but 10 states did that. So... Not a good analogy. The Biden tax credit, um, it didn't start phasing out until $125,000 of income. The AFDC benefit would, was phasing out at like $200 of income, $400 of income, like just on a monthly basis. Um, so I guess that would be like $5,000 annually. So you got a, a phase out that starts at 125 grand versus one that starts at like five grand. It just depends on the state and exactly how you calculate it. These are very different programs. Also, the phase out in the Biden one was five cents per dollar beyond 125 grand. This again, like I said, is 100 cents per dollar uh, for every dollar beyond the threshold. Um, very, very different. Very, very different when it comes to uh, work incentives. Um, so what else do we have? So that's just a fucking stupid analogy i think some of the i think especially patrick brown probably knows that but whatever man's got to eat i suppose um so what's the other issue right so work is one issue marriage is supposed to be the other so this is always a fun one as ai's nick eberstadt has pointed out the share of men without any connection to the labor force has been on a slow upward climb over the decades giving families unconditional cash cash would make men even more superfluous too generous a child benefit for families without a worker reduces the necessity of having another parent in the home. Now, I want to, I want to, well, I think it's important to be super clear here to match this text with what is actually being advocated here. They are not arguing that we should not provide cash benefits to children. They are arguing that we should not provide cash benefits to poor children. But why does providing it to poor children make men non-superfluous, while providing it to middle-class children does not make men non-superfluous, right? What they're getting at here is the idea that if, especially women and mothers, if they have their own incomes, then they don't need a man's income. They can just live on their own and they're good to go. But that's more true of a middle-class woman who has a, a salary and a career than it is a poor woman, right? If a woman is making $50,000 a year in the labor market, she is more, I should say, she is less in need of a man than a woman who is making $0 in the labor market, right? Follow me. So who do they want to give the cash benefit to? They're giving it to the woman who's making 50000 a year, but she's already more independent than the one who's making zero. Do you see what I'm saying? It doesn't add up here. If you're trying to make someone more dependent on a second income, then you don't want to give it to these women who already have independent streams of income. It doesn't make any sense. But beyond that, the whole kind of moral element of this, this sort of philosophical element of this is like just clearly repugnant. Right? The idea here is let's make poor people, let's make poor children even poorer, and let's make their mothers poor so that they'll be so desperate that they'll, that they'll go out and marry someone and, and, and be with a man. 
And I always find these marriage people really weird because, I mean, I like marriage. I'm good job. Go get married. I'm all for it, you know? Um, but marriage is, if marriage is good, then you don't need to, like, basically put a gun to someone's head and say, marry or starve. Or it reminds me of the lock quote, a dagger to their throat and say, marry or die. Right? I mean, you know, <laughs> why are we taking hostages to get people to marry? If you think marriage is good, then people will get married. Then like, well, you don't need to put a gun to someone's head to get them to do something that's good. Right? So what you're talking about just necessarily is trying to get someone to marry someone that they, that they don't want to marry. And I'm going to say on balance, while there are exceptions, on balance, people who are choosing not to marry someone, especially people who are in precarious situations, they probably have decent reasons for it, right? The average marriage is not the same thing as the marginal marriage. People who are like, mm, I don't know about that guy. I don't know if I want to live with that guy. They could be experiencing domestic violence. They could be, be experiencing emotional abuse, verbal abuse, financial abuse, a whole string of things. There's a whole string of reasons why people say, I'm not going to marry, even at great financial, uh, arguably great financial cost to themselves, or reasons why people say they're going to divorce, right? And the idea that, yeah, well, w but if you do that, we're going to starve your child, <laughs> in order to get marriage and just like add marriages to the tally, regardless of the quality of the marriage involved, is sick, 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 sick shit. Um, and then again, like I said, the way that they apply it also doesn't make sense because the only pe the people who are the most independent, the people who need a man the least, are the people that they're giving the money to. Right? Like there's, and then the conservatives, they're always kind of, they're always having this problem with their like kind of traditional family shit. On the one hand, they don't want the woman to work. And part of the reason they don't want the woman to work is because they want them to be dependent upon the man. Right? But on the other hand, if you don't work, they get mad at you and they're like, no, nah, you can't have money. You really need to work. So they want women both to work and to not work. And they can't keep their arguments about that straight. They can't keep their arguments about that straight. So here, they're saying, we want women to be dependent upon men so that they'll marry. And so what we're going to do is we're going to phase it. We're going to say that the only way you can get a child benefit is if you work. But if they go work, they're now less dependent upon men, right? Now they're less, de like the benefit you're giving them is going to make, if it actually works and it causes them to go out and get a job, now they're less dependent upon men and now they don't e they're even less in need of marriage. Right? And again, reject the whole, all the morality underneath, like the whole like normative element of this disgusting. You should reject it outright. But like internally, it makes no fucking sense to say we got to get women more dependent upon men so that they'll marry. And the way we're going to do that is to get women in the workforce and give them a separate source of income. That doesn't make sense. That's, that's fucking in incoherent. But here they go, they just, you know, like they, they've got no, just in a religious magazine. Anyways, so we'll discard that one. What else have we got here? This is the other piece. I'll probably spend a little bit more time on this one. The true cost of expanding the child tax credit by Scott Winship. Um, here we go. He's talking about, again, the Biden child tax credit. Remember, it went to the poor. Ooh, that's great. Um, you know, it did reduce poverty. Here we go. Uh, nearly two years later, there's much better evidence about the likely costs and benefits of the policy. In the short run, the child allowance really did help to reduce poverty by a sizable amount, a point that many critics of the program are loath to concede. But new research suggests that the long-term effects will be much smaller. Okay, what's the new research? Right? We've got the research about the reduction in poverty, 29%. I would say this is an estimate. I don't want to go into my issues with some of that, but okay, cool. No doubt a lot of that, you know, a lot of poor people managed to get the money and it pushed them over the poverty line. Thumbs up. Good for them. So what's the issue? Why is that not the end of the debate? 
Because in the medium to long run, giving the same amount to parents regardless of whether they work will cause some parents to stop working. That will negate some of the poverty reducing impact of the child allowance. Okay. And new research after the arrival of those monthly child allowance checks suggests the countervailing, of, countervailing effects would be worrisomely large. Right? So he says new research multiple times here. New research. New research. What is this new fucking research he's talking about? This paper, <laughs> a University of Chicago study from October 2021, new research, who knows, over a fucking year old, led by the economist Kevin Corinth and Bruce Meyer, concluded that if, child al- if the child allowance was made permanent, 1.5 million parents would stop working. As a result, child poverty falling by one-third, the decline would be 22%. So let's go to the paper here. This is the new research. The anti-poverty effect of targeting and labor supply effects on the proposed child tax credit expansion, blah, 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 blah. Relying on elasticity estimates consistent with mainstream simulation models in the academic literature, we estimate that this change in policy would lead to one and a half million workers constituting 2.6% of all working parents to exit the labor force, the decline in employment and the consequent earnings loss would mean that child poverty would only fall by 22% only. And deep child, deep child poverty would not fall at all. Now, it's important to, uh, before we get going here, to characterize this paper uh, accurately, okay? This is not new research in any ordinary sense of the word. Where does he use it? New research. This is not new research, okay? I've read this paper. I wrote a piece about this paper. I'm not going to click through and run you through it here, um, but I'll show you my piece. New research would be, we went out into the world. I don't want to police the word new research, I guess. You know, (laughs) I don't want to fight, have a fight with that. But typically, when I hear something is new, I think, oh, someone has gone out into the world and they've either gotten new data that didn't exist anymore, that didn't exist before, right? So sometimes you can go get fresh data from the IRS that no one's ever seen, and you can do some cool stuff with that. Raj Chetty has done a, made a career of that, basically. You can go out and collect your own data. You can run your own research. Occasionally, you might take data that exists and has been sitting around for a long time, and you'll do novel stuff with it. You'll do novel calculations with it, you know, do some extra special math with it, at, try to answer questions with it no one has tried to answer before. That is not what happened here. Instead, we have relying on elasticity estimates consistent with mainstream simulation models in the academic literature. This is a long way of saying they went into a few papers about the earned income tax credit, that some of which are 25 plus years old. Okay, They, they went into those papers, and those papers had an estimate that said when you phase in a benefit, meaning you exclude the poor, when you phase in a benefit at a certain rate, it creates incentives for people to work. And this is how much people respond to those incentives. You know, for every dollar uh, that you increase their incentive to work by the way that you phase in the benefit, uh, such and such number of people will go out and work, right? They just take those numbers from those papers. Again, many of these papers, 25 years old. And then they just apply that number to the current, the current population survey and go, if those numbers are correct, then this is what will happen, right? One and a half million people will drop out of the workforce. If those numbers are correct, right? If the elasticity from the EITC, from a paper, many of which are decades old, if those elasticities still hold and also apply to the child tax credit, then, if then, one and a half million people will fall, will come out of the labor force and all these single mothers will quit their jobs and actually the poverty effect won't, it won't be really as much of a poverty effect as you would expect. Okay. I don't know what you want to call that. What I call that is just like applying some math from old papers to the existing current population survey. That's, to, I don't know, is that new research? I, you know, <laughs> to, to me, that's not new research. But whatever, whatever. Right, It makes a prediction about what's going to happen. It says, look, we've got this child tax credit. 
it no longer phases in. It no longer excludes the poor because that was the big thing with the new child tax rate. It no longer excludes the poor. And if it doesn't exclude the poor, it reduces the incentive to work, right? And so in my view is that the that reduction in the incentive to work is going to cause this many people to drop out of the labor force and actually poverty is only going to fall by this much, right? It's a prediction. It's a prediction in which you apply old elasticities to like a new policy and you say, this is what I think will happen based on these old elasticities, okay? And I wanted to give a more clear-cut explanation of what they're talking about because uh, the paper is a little bit, these things can be really difficult for people to understand. Um, but I think, I think this graph catches it. I don't know. Maybe this is even more difficult uh, for someone to understand. But what's important to understand, let's say if you, have, you have a single mother with two kids, right? And on the uh, horizontal axis here, we have how much money that sh is she earning, right, from her job, okay? And we have, with these lines here, we have her marginal tax rate. So that's how much she, tax she pays, you know, on every dollar. So when she goes from here to here to here, here, this is her tax rate, right? Now you'll notice these tax rates right here are negative, and that seems really strange. But a negative tax rate just means that for every dollar you make, like say you're at 30%, negative 30% here, instead of paying 30 cents, the government pays you 30 cents, right? So if you, you make $1,000, then the government pays you 300 and your, your net income is 1300 And so that's what they do with these tax credits, especially the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, is every dollar you earn, the government kicks in like a matching amount that you get at tax time the next year in the form of a tax credit. And that's supposed to incentivize you to work because it, it essentially makes your wage higher, right? Working pays off more. So before we, before Biden cut out the phase in for the child tax credit, what we had was this black line here. Now what you can see here is at first the black and the red are overlapping. So the incentive here to work is like what, 32%? Yeah. So 32.5% roughly. So for every dollar you make, the government kicks in about 32 cents, you know, to incentivize you to work. No different. The only real difference when we're talking about low earners is this part of the distribution here. When you had the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit both phasing in, every dollar you earn, the government would kick in roughly 47 cents. And then after we did the CTC and we said, no, we're just going to give you the whole CTC. It's not going to phase any in anymore. Then every dollar you earn instead, the government was only going to kick in 32 cents. Right, so you go from the government giving you 47 cents of matching funds to 32 cents of matching funds. And it's that difference, that difference from being able to get an extra 47 cents for every dollar you earn to only getting 32 cents for every dollar you earn, that difference, that 15 cent difference, that's what's going to cause one and a half million people to drop out of the labor force. And I included a funny example here of what, <laughs> of like what, they're saying in concrete terms here. And I say, look, imagine a single mother with two kids who earns 20 grand, right? Before the Biden CTC, what would happen is she'd have to pay this much in income tax, this much in Medicare tax, this much in Social Security tax. And then this is how much she'd get from the EITC and the CTC, right? So her final income would be 27229 right? So it's more than, than she earned because these tax credits, like I said, match her. When we get the Biden CTC, he just gives you the full CTC. He doesn't make you earn it anymore. Um, so in that case, and he increased the amount. But in that case, the same woman, if she just stays doing what she's been doing, just stays in her job, instead of winding up with 27229 she winds up with $30,544, right? Because the CTC uh, is now more generous and also doesn't phase in anymore, right? So she winds up with you know, about three thirty three hundred 3,300 extra dollars of income if she stays in her job, if she stays in her job. But what they're saying, remember, is she's going to quit her job. She's going to quit her job and just live on this. That's what she's going to do. So she could just stay in her job and see her income go up by three grand, which she probably would like, or she could quit her job and live in deep poverty on $6,000 a year. Their claim in this paper, is that 10% of single moms who are in this situation up here, 10% of single moms who are in this situation here 
will just quit their job. And rather than just take the extra 3300 and like have a good time with it and like be less poor, they're going to live in deep poverty on six grand. That was their claim. This is on its face ridiculous. And remember, the reason they're going to do this, the proximate reason they're going to do this is because instead of earning, instead of getting 47 cents on the dollar, they're only going to get 32 cents on the dollar. The government's still going to increase by, they're still going to give them 33 cents for every dollar they earn. They're still getting a big bump from the government every time, but not as much. And so 10% of single moms are going to quit their job and live in deep poverty. Yeah. So you, you ask yourself initially, is that plausible? Does that seem reasonable? You know, like maybe these elasticity estimates you're relying upon, to the extent that they generate this conclusion that 10% of single moms are going to just give up this money and live in deep poverty, to the extent that they generate that conclusion, maybe they're wrong. Maybe that's just fucking incorrect. And those elasticity estimates are just bad. I don't know. Let's, let's see. Now, one way we could uh, assess this and see whether it's true is since we've had the child tax credit last year, we now have data. You can actually, instead of guessing what's going to happen when you introduce the child tax credit, you can just look at what happened. Instead of using 25-year-old elasticities from papers about the earned income tax credit and saying, oh, if I apply those, the math implies blah, 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 blah. Instead of guessing using old elasticities, why not just do a new paper using the actual data from the actual child tax credit? We did that here. Effects of the expanded child tax credit on employment outcomes, evidence from real-world data from April to December 2021. These are the four authors. Here's the finding. We find very small, inconsistently signed, meaning both ways, and statistically insignificant impacts of the CTC, both on employment in the prior week and on active participation in the labor force among adults living in households with children. Further, labor supply responses to the policy change do not differ for households for whom the CTC's expansion eliminated a previous work incentive. Thus, our analyses of real-world data suggest that the expanded CTC did not have negative short-term employment effects that offset its documented reductions in poverty and hardship. Okay. So, interesting prediction about what would happen. The prediction ended up false. Untrue. Didn't happen. So, this is new research, <laughs> to take a step back. This is new. This is where you get new data and you go, let me test this hypothesis. Oh, no, unconfirmed. The shit where you take 25-year-old elasticities and fucking run it in a spreadsheet, that is not new research. It's not, okay? But before we just let this sit um, and just be like, oh, he was wrong. I mean, I guess you could end the video now if you wanted. But if you want to get a better rundown of the stupidity of the elasticity estimates he's using, I wanted to take you through the earned income tax credit because that's what he's talking about. Even though we're debating the child tax credit, he's, de he's really talking about the earned income tax credit. And the earned income tax credit has been a big topic for decades and decades. Liberals and conservatives both love it for different reasons. And it's been this great kumbaya moment in politics. And I, I think the reason it's been a great kumbaya moment in our politics is because uh, people believe things about it that are not true, that are just clearly, obviously false. And the main thing that they believe about it that's false is that it massively increases work, right? Because that's the flip side of the CTC is that the EITC, because it phases in, because it excludes the poor, there's supposed to be a big incentive that gets people out to work. And there is research that suggests maybe that it does that. And so what Bruce does, he says, well, let's just flip it on its head. If, if phasing in a benefit causes a bunch of people to work, then getting rid of the phase in will cause a bunch of people to quit. <laughs> Except it fucking didn't. But I want to point out, I would like to take a take a step here and say, if you want to make a sense and harmonize all of this, the easiest way to harmonize all of this is to just say that old EITC research that suggests that people are responding to the incentive of the phase-in and going out to work in mass is wrong, is obviously wrong, is stupidly wrong. So for that, let's start here. 
If you want to prove that someone is responding to a financial incentive, that it's causing them to change their behavior, I think you should prove two things in this order. First, people know that the financial incentive exists. The reason I think you should prove this is because I do not think that people can respond to incentives that they do not know exist. Let me give you a thought experiment. Let's say that I declared to myself in my head that every time someone comes and knocks on my door, I will give them $5, but I don't tell anyone this. Can they respond to that incentive? I don't think so. And I'm going to posit that's true of all things. If you do not know that doing something will get you money, then you cannot respond to the incentive. <laughs> like, I know this sounds like, like I'm like a crazy man rambling here, but literally, that's the most basic shit. That's the, like, for starters, show to me that people even know that this incentive exists. If you can't prove that, then the debate's over. People can't respond to shit that they don't know exists. The debate's over. So what do we have on this, right? Because people have tried to figure this out. They've tried to figure out, do people know about the EITC? And what do they know about it? So this is a paper from um, hein Heinrich, Heinrich Clevin. Um, I'm going to go a lot into this paper, but for now, I just want to focus on this particular part because it's a great summation of a lot of research on this particular question, right? So Clevin writes, of crucial importance to interpretation is the literature on EITC knowledge in their study of extensive margin responses to the 1986 EITC expansion, Issa and Liebman cite evidence from interviews conducted in 1993 showing virtually no awareness of the credit among potential recipients. A number of subsequent studies have documented the presence of substantial frictions related to the awareness, understanding, and claiming of the ITC. Cite, 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 cite. You can click through those. You can read them. They say what he says. For example, MAG 2005 reports that only 58% of low-income families had heard about the EITC in a nationally representative sample, right? So they'd heard about it. They claim, okay? <laughs> But what is more, the understanding of how the schedule is designed is even weaker. Among the families interviewed by Romick and Wiesner, most people had heard of the ITC, but virtually no one knew that they needed to earn a certain amount to maximize the credit. Chetty, who uses a proxy for knowledge, so Chetty does not ask people, do you know about this program? He uses a proxy for knowledge. Uh, which is essentially the degree to which people are defrauding the EITC program. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but he uses that proxy for knowledge, and he shows that, uh, that, that knowledge has been increasing over time and was relatively limited in the mid-90s. So we get study after study after study showing that people do not know that this program exists, and to the extent that they'll tell you that they know it exists, if you ask them the key question, which is, how do you claim this program? with the answer being, oh, well, you need to earn a certain amount of money because then you become eligible. Because like, It doesn't even have to be like real specific. I don't need you to tell me that the phase-in rate is 42% for families with three... It, I'm not even that level of specificity. Do you know that to get the EITC, you actually have to go earn a certain amount of money? Virtually nobody knows that, right? So if you don't know that this exists and you don't know that the way it's structured, the incentive that that creates, how can you be responsive to it? You can't be. And so what I wanted to do, I actually created a slide because I could figure out a better way to get this across here, but I hope my head's not taking up the bottom there. But the, there are three findings in the EITC research that are seen as kind of like, this is like the state of the state of the research for the most part, okay? <laughs> the first finding, which I just discussed, is that very few of the relevant population knows that the EITAC exists and even fewer understand how it works, okay? That's number one. Number two, workers who could receive more EITC benefit if they worked more hours don't do it, right? So think about someone who's working 10 hours a week. If they went to 15 hours a week, they could get more money because of the way the EIT, but they don't do it, 
right? And even someone who maybe they lost a job, if they would get reemployed uh, more quickly, they could get more hours on the year and therefore get more EITC. They don't do it, right? So the, they are unresponsive to this incentive. This is called the intensive margin, right? So someone who's already a worker, why don't you just work more? And since the government's kicking in, you know, 40 plus cents per dollar earned, you'll get that. And they just don't respond to it at all. None of the research finds any response on the intensive margin. On the other hand, non-workers who could receive more EITC benefit if they worked do do so in large numbers. Excuse me. So they are very responsive to that incentive. This is called the extensive margin. These three findings don't hang together. It cannot be that people don't know this program exists and yet they're super responsive to it. It cannot be that people don't know that you need to earn a certain amount of money in order to get a benefit and yet be super responsive to it. You cannot respond to incentives that you don't know about or that you don't understand. Furthermore, if they are somehow responsive, if for some reason people can respond to things that they don't know exists, then they should be responsive on the intensive margin as well as the extensive margin. They should be responsive on both margins, but they're only responsive on one margin. How can that be? How do these, be? it doesn't make sense, right? So someone like uh, Scott Winship, who wrote the New York Times article, he'd be like, I'm just, <laughs> or Bruce Meyer, they'd be like, we're just dealing with the consensus of the EITC research. It all finds that. What I'll tell you is, if you take it together, what the EITC research, there's no consensus. It's just wildly inconclusive, right? These three things, what they show you is that we don't have an understanding of what's going on here, right? You can say, oh, no, we find this. We find this a lot. We find this a lot. And so what we're finding, but no, if you find this while also finding this, right? If you find that people are very responsive to an incentive that they also don't know exists, but also they're not responsive in this other way that their behavior is incentivized. What you're finding is basically uh, noise. It's just like trash, right? We don't have findings that uh, correspond to a specific story or theory of how this works. It's just a lot of conflicting bullshit. And it's funny, uh, Clevin actually points this out. <laughs> people acknowledge that these informational frictions exist, that people don't fucking know that the ITC exists. And what they have done is they've decided to actually use that to explain why there are no intensive margin responses. So why don't people increase their work hours if that's incentivized? And they go, well, they just don't know the program exists. They don't understand it, right? <laughs> but as he points out, this doesn't make sense. This is not consistent with economic theory or basic introspection. The same models that are gonna tell you that there are extensive margin effects should also tell you that there are intensive margin effects, right? These two things should be incentivized similarly. You can't go, oh, well, yeah, people don't respond to the incentive by working more because they don't understand the program. Oh, but they, 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 but they go to work in mass because of the program. No, it's the same thing. Anyways, don't believe this research is what I'm telling you. Recently... I'll call this new research. This is new research. It's from 2019, new research. Um, we've got this paper from Heinrich Klevin um, in which he actually tries to tackle the extensive margin effect. Remember the extensive margin effect, that's the one where the people are super responsive to these incentives. And that's why you got to exclude the poor because people are so responsive to these incentives. They go out to work in mass and that's a big plus, right? So he's going to say, uh, not so much. What, do, what evidence do we really have that there is a huge extensive margin response? Here he is. I investigate every EITC reform at the state and federal level since the inception of the policy in 1975 based on event studies comparing single women with and without children or comparing single mothers with different numbers of children. I show that the only EITC reform associated with clear employment increases is the expansion enacted in 1993. The employment increases in the mid-late 90s are large, but they are influenced by confounding effects of welfare reform and a booming macro economy. Based on different approaches that exploit variation in these, con in these confounders across household type, space, and time, 
I show that the employment effects align closely with exposure to welfare reform in the business cycle. Single mothers who were unaffected by welfare reform but eligible for the EITC did not respond. Overall, and contrary to consensus, the size, the case for a sizable extensive margin effects of the EITC is fragile. Okay, so let's do some graphs. This is for the federal one. He examines every federal expansion, you know, which is five here, and 12 state expansion. Actually, he analyzes every state expansion, but then does the, the big state expansions. Uh, most of the, the research only analyzes one, and typically they just analyze this one the 1986 EITC expansion, or this one. He analyzes all five plus every single state one and with a big focus on the 12 like big expansions on the state level, okay? And so here's what happens, right? The maximum EITC credit, which remember it's phased in, so you have to work to get it. You know, it comes into existence in 1975. It increases here in 1986, it increases in 1990, it increases big time in 93, it increases again in 2009. So at the point where these things are increasing, the incentive to work is getting bumped up. And so what we want to do is we want to say, well, what happened around these increases? Did people actually work? And now remember, these, this benefit is mostly targeted to single mothers. So what we try to do is we try to you know, look at the single mothers and see what they're doing right around the time of these expansions, okay? So this is a good figure here. We have the labor force participation for single women um, with and without children. So as you can see, between 1968 and 1993, during which time we have one, two, three EITC expansions. Right between so across these three EITC expansions, there's no difference. The gap between single mother and or the gap between women with children and women without children, their labor force participation is unchanged. Right, so right off the bat, these three don't look good. Right, because nothing is happening like specific to women with children. The women with children are the only women who are eligible for these EITCs. Right. But as you can see, at, and after 1993, which is this change here, after 1993, then we see whoom, it goes up. Okay, So that's, that's the one where he's like, oh, all right, there's something that happened there. So what is it? You know, We don't see anything happening anywhere. The other one, remember, we have an expansion here in, in 2009. We've got this one here, a nice big jump for um, especially uh, women with three kids. We got this jump here, um, no change. Right? So this is the only one where we just kind of looking at raw, like descriptive stats, we see something happening. Okay. Oh, shit, I should have probably just put it on here. Here's the graph with the lines on it, right? So you see nothing, 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 nothing. Oh, something here, something here. So what he does, he says, says okay, well, let's look at this area where uh, shit's popping off. And is there anything else going on that might explain it? Because it's weird, because every other thing, we don't see any response. We only see the response to the one. So what's going on here that might explain it? Um, oh, and here's another good graph that's kind of a fun one. Um, so one of the curiosities here is we can also break up women by the number of kids. So not just do you have kids or not, but we also have zero kids, one kid, two kid, three kid. Notice that the response is different based on the number of kids. So the response for one kid is a much more muted, two kids, and then the response for three kids is huge. But here's the weird thing. In 1993, this change, the benefit increase for women with two children or three children was the same. Like they didn't, you didn't get extra if you had three kids. Like two kids you would max out. So the the incentive change for these two women was identical. But the three plus children, they went way up, right? So that doesn't make sense, right? If you treat the two children and the three children the same, if you give them the same additional incentive to work, then you would expect a similar jump, but you don't, you see the jump much bigger for three kids. And then here in 2009, the only increase was for women with three plus kids. And we don't see anything at all there. So the, so the one where there wasn't a special three-kid bump, they get a huge uh, response from them. And the one where there is a specific three-kid bump, in fact, only a three-kid bump, you don't get anything. It's weird. 
Anyways, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? He basically looks at two big things. He says, okay, let's take this pro- let's take this period where shit's popping off, okay? Um, and we have the impact on it, unemployment. And what happens if we control for unemployment in the state, right? Because different states had different macroeconomic conditions, and, un- and some of them, the states were booming. So what if we kind of control for those macroeconomic differences? Well, right off the bat, the black line is if you don't control for it. The blue line is if you do, right? So right off the bat, the blue line's popped down a bit. But, you know, there's still positive effects. So maybe the EITC do it, is doing something, just not too much. So and then the next thing he does, he says, okay, let's also control for welfare reform ravers. So during this period of time, um, welfare reform is right here. But between this period, states were given the power to start doing their own kinds of welfare reforms. They were given waivers. Some states took advantage of this and some states did not. And what the waivers let you do was really kind of like kick people off of welfare, right? And that was the aid to families with dependent children, which we discussed earlier in the video. It allowed you to start kicking people off of welfare. And so what he does, he says, well, let's control for that. Some states started doing that and some states didn't, okay? And when we do that, look, the blue, it goes away entirely. Between this period, which is where you see the rapid run-up, right after the ITC, we don't see anything. It's gone, right? We start seeing uh, movements here, but we see that with both women, right? So, unless you're saying uh, there's a delayed response, it takes six, seven years <laughs> for people to start doing it. We don't really see anything. What we seem to have seen was a booming macro economy and welfare reform waivers, and people have just simply misinterpreted that as having some kind of huge extensive margin effect. And then he does the same thing with all the state EITC reforms. So here he just kind of Here's when the reform occurs, and he kind of collapses them all together. And here's the effect on employment using synthetic control, nothing. Here, if we only do the big reforms, so some states just had tiny EITC reforms, some states had big ones, nothing. Nothing. I mean, there's just nothing here. So if we go back to here, if you want to make sense of all this, here's, here's an idea. Um... Non-workers who could receive more EITC benefit if they worked, do not do so. Do not do so. They are unresponsive to that incentive. Problem solved. This is consistent with everything, right? It's consistent with no finding of an employment effect here. It's consistent with the fact that nobody knows the program exists. It's done with a very well done paper. This is using um, uh, synthetic control methods and certain regression uh, and certain controls that other uh, papers didn't. 2019, very well respected economists, right? We're not using 25 year old papers, using old methods that don't have controls for important variables. We're using a recent paper with good controls, good methods, and now we have an answer to the puzzle that actually makes sense, which is that people cannot respond to incentives that they do not know exist. Would they respond if they knew it exists? I don't know, but that's just not where we're at, right? And this is the research he uses to say that we can't have this program. This is the research they're all relying upon to say that we cannot provide benefits to poor kids, despite the fact that all these other countries do it, despite the fact that when we actually look at the effect, doesn't have an effect on kids, uh, on, on, the working, uh, on the workforce participation of the parents. Despite all that, we still, you know, this is the, the thinnest of fucking reads, the thinnest of fucking rationales that conservatives are trotting out there these days in order to argue that we should impoverish children. That and because we need to get them to marry more, <laughs> which I've already gone over. So, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 frustrating. It's frustrating. Of course, this published in the New York Times. I mean, whatever. I'm not going to try to police that, but like, there's nothing here. Um, and pro family conservatives are they don't exist. I mean, they just they functionally don't exist. Right, the whole conservative establishment, even the ones that really like to, oh, I just, you know, I'm kind of a crunchy guy, and I really, I love family, and and what I, and I love marriage, and I like, they exist to crush the poor, 
I mean, if you just want to observe what they do, they're here to fight providing benefits to poor kids. Really uncontroversial benefits that exist everywhere in the world work fine. They just, that's what they're out here doing, right? So judge for yourself uh, who you want to line up with, but I would never line up with that. So anyways, let me know if you get any more ideas. I love doing these videos. Um, Merry Christmas. I uh, wish we'd gotten a second child benefit payment <laughs> like Finland got. Um, but we did not. And in fact, uh, uh, the poorest kids, uh, they will get coal in their stockings in order to motivate their parents to work and marry. So good society, a good society we live in. I'll see you later.